members, welcome back for another episode of Gotta TV. Our first quarter issue of Welding Gases today is online now and should be hitting your desks this week if you haven't received already. The first quarter issue is our annual forecast issue and features insight into what Gotta distributors and suppliers are expecting this year. One recurring theme that came about when putting the forecast together is the impact the supply chain shortages and specifically difficulty sourcing CO2 are causing for the industry. Today's episode features a trio of speakers involved in the CO2 industry who will discuss different facets of the shortage. Joining us first today is Jake Maynard, General Manager for Sutton Garden. Jake, we appreciate you joining the show. Today's episode deals with the ongoing CO2 shortage. Can you discuss that shortage and how it's impacted your business as well as your customers? Yeah, for us, we, we've definitely seen the shortage during different times of the year. Um, a couple of years ago, we made a corporate decision to bring in two suppliers and not one. So we're very fortunate that a lot of corn and ethanol is produced here in the state of Indiana. So we partnered up with Air Products and Poet, uh, who have been incredible suppliers to us. Um, and we're very happy for them to be a part of our team. I, I think where the shortages maybe hurt us a little bit during the summers was so many opportunities to grow. And once we kind of hit our contractual obligations in purchasing, we just weren't able to buy any more. Um, so that's what's kind of really hurt us is our suppliers have been great supplying us. But when it kind of comes to that exceptional growth outside of our contract is where we definitely saw a slowdown. We just couldn't buy as much as we needed to as, as the customers were calling asking for more. How have you managed the supply of CO2 that you have received? Have you had any conversations with your customers to educate them about what's going on? And what has that process been like? Yeah, we, we've uh, really improved our storage capacity on site. Um, we're a, a good regional player for dry ice manufacturing. So we've actually updated. Uh, we have 360 tons of storage capacity on site right now, which really helps kind of the ebbs and flows coming off of force majeure. Because uh, typically those last a week or two. And a lot of times the lead time is really getting the tanks filled back up. So it's nice to have that type of storage capacity on site um, just to kind of even things out during a force majeure. And that's something we, we communicate directly with our customers up front is that it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when a force majeure is going to happen. So we're very transparent there. And then letting them know that uh, when it does come in, we're very uh, on, the, on the front edge of, of letting them know ahead of time so they can plan accordingly. And then that just that extra backup storage capacity helps us keep liquid levels in uh, as the suppliers are trying to get the trucks back out on the road and, and keep, get everybody topped off. Have you had to explore any alternative sources of CO2 at all? And if so, which ones? The uh, ethanol market is still very strong here, so 100% still comes from the ethanol market. We are starting to see some more of the biogas and the digester market popping up in our area. There is word that there's one potentially opening kind of in Northwest Indiana, and we've talked to them, uh, but it's still in the early on process of acquiring the equipment, uh, the transportation, the logistics, and actually starting to see that process come to market. But we have put our name in there. They know we're interested. And uh, we all certainly want to diversify into any opportunity that's in, in our market that's close by. So I think we're going to see some more of the, the digest or biogas market pop up, uh, especially in certain areas where ethanol or uh, ammonia aren't very prevalent. Um, so, yeah, we've got our foot in the door, and we're hoping that uh, as those come up that we've got an opportunity to buy from those companies. You're familiar with the idea of making lemonade out of lemons. Have you been able to implement any process improvements throughout the shortage? Yes, Steve. We have seen some uh, pretty significant efficiencies that we're trying to put together, specifically in our dry ice manufacturing. The yield from making dry ice from CO2 doesn't work to our advantage, especially during a force majeure. So we have... Um, developed our relationships with our partners to put in efficiencies equipment. Uh, the first one we put in was a heat exchanger to chill the incoming liquid before it goes into a pelletizer to help increase those yields for us. And then secondly, this will be installed at the end of Q1, is we're putting in reclamation equipment. We know that there's quite a bit of exhaust that comes off of our pipes during the manufacturing process. So our new equipment will receive that vent, chill it, clean it, and liquefy it and stick it back in our tank for reuse. So that allows our existing customers to continue to grow with us and help us during times of force majeure because we're just running as efficiently as we possibly can. Has telemetry helped you better manage your supply of CO2 at all? But we certainly utilize the telemetry on our bulk side. With 360 tons of capacity, 
we get a ton of trucks coming and going specifically with two different vendors. So it's important that everybody's on the same page on what our current levels look like. So we are using it on our bulk tanks. We're starting to use it in our beverage industry. We have about 1500 customers spread throughout the state of Indiana. Uh, we're in the process of talking to several different vendors, but that would certainly help during times of force majeure to um, run as efficiently as possible and only fill the tanks that we need to be filled until supply gets turned back on. What are you hearing about the state of the industry for this coming year? So yeah, our, our suppliers have done a nice job uh, keeping us up to date on what's going on with their equipment. And we're seeing some pretty good consistent CO2 being uh, outputted and delivered to us. We haven't seen much interruption uh, yet. That Once that gets um, teed up in the summer, we'll probably run into a couple issues. But the biggest thing on our radar is keeping um, in contact with what's going on with the federal government and giving carbon producers uh, carbon credits to recapture the CO2 and put it into a pipeline and put it underground. They're incentivizing them I think the current rate net right now is $85 a ton to sequester it and put it in the ground. So that we're keeping that uh, on our radar because we certainly want to make sure that there's still f an, enough CO2 sold commercially uh, in our marketplace. Um, but it's kind of too early to tell. A pipeline has to be built. I'm sure some joint ventures will get together with the ethanol companies um, and try to sequester more CO2. Um, but we have been in contact with our current suppliers about trying to make more CO2 at their plants and putting in more skids. So I think there'll be a market for sequestration as well as CO2 that's sold commercially, but in all honesty, it's too early to tell. Jake, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. This is a major topic in the industry, and after the break, we have two more great interviews coming your way. Plus, with less than two months left before this year's SMC in Philadelphia, stick around for another SMC update. All of that, plus news from around the industry, right after a word from today's presenting sponsor, Datacore. The packaged gas and welding supply industry needs a comprehensive software tool to track assets and effectively manage price volatility, procurement challenges, and new regulatory requirements. Datacore ERP does all of this and more. Our software helps gas distributors refine shipping and inventory processes, improve production and distribution models, track assets, and achieve long and short range planning with greater accuracy. Start using data to grow your business, enhance your productivity, and enable success with Datacore. Joining us next today is Paul Gross. Paul is the co-founder and CEO of Remora. Paul, we appreciate you being on the show today. Paul, Remora joined Gata earlier this year. Can you tell us a little bit about what your company does and why you decided to join the association? Remora builds a device that captures the carbon emissions straight from the tailpipe of a semi-truck. So you can picture this big box that goes on the back of the tractor, right between the tractor and the trailer, attaches to the tractor's tailpipe, and then captures about 80% of the tractor's carbon emissions. We can then take that high purity, sustainable CO2 and work with end users to utilize it in all kinds of different ways. And we take the revenue from the CO2 and share it back with the fleet. So the device pays for itself over its lifetime and we can help big fleets decarbonize quickly. We decided to join GATA because we're you know, super excited to be getting into the CO2 industry. We want to build partnerships um, with as many different um, players in the industry as possible. And, you know, as, as a new source of CO2, as a new supply, um, we think the kind of sustainability of the CO2, the reliability of the CO2 uh, could be really exciting and, and perhaps helpful um, in a lot of places. So that's why we decided to join. We're really excited to be a member. You mentioned the new source of CO2. Today's episode is all about the CO2 shortage facing our industry. How can this carbon capture technology help GATA members address this shortage? So the carbon capture technology that we've invented um, basically captures about 200 to 250 tons of CO2 from the average semi-truck. So that means at just 5,000 trucks, we're capturing a million tons of CO2 every year. And there are millions of these trucks on the road. So you can do the math. This is a potential new supply of hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 every year. And you know, it's a reliable supply as well. 
these trucks run day in, day out, very predictable schedule all year round. There are no huge outages um, for months at a time, which means that the supply of CO2 that we're capturing is very reliable, very predictable, um, and I think can be a really great supplement to the other supplies of CO2 that in recent years have been a little bit less predictable and a little bit less reliable. Not to mention the CO2 that we're selling is sustainable. You know, it's being prevented from going into the atmosphere. It's helping to decarbonize one of the toughest sectors uh, to decarbonize, which is transportation emissions. Can you talk about what the retrofit process is like? Is it a difficult thing to attach to the trucks? It's actually super straightforward. Basically, the system bolts onto the tractor right behind the tractor, you know, in that gap between the tractor and the trailer on a class eight truck. And it bolts into the frame rails using existing aftermarket bolt holes. So they're there from the OEMs to bolt things in. We follow the OEM bodybuilder guidelines and our mounting system has been uh, approved by multiple OEMs. We've gotten many third parties to test. So it's incredibly safe. It's very straightforward. Um, and then the system just attaches to the tailpipe and starts capturing CO2. So it's a really straightforward installation process. Um, and it's a very easy device to maintain. With the Inflation Reduction Act that was signed into law last year, addressing greenhouse gas emissions and climate change was a huge focus of the law. Part of that is the 45Q tax credit. Can you explain what that tax credit is and how it affects Remora and potentially other GATA members? The 45Q tax credit for carbon sequestration, it's a bipartisan tax credit. You know, it was it's been expanded a couple times, and what it does is incentivizes folks to utilize CO2 that's been captured from sources like a semi-truck tailpipe or to sequester it underground in EPA certified wells. So under the Inflation Reduction Act, you now get $60 per ton of CO2 utilized if you're taking it from a truck tailpipe and you know turning it into jet fuel or, or turning it into another um, sort of cool end use case. And then if you're taking that CO2 and pumping it into an EPA certified well, you get $85 per ton. So that's permanent sequestration. So it's this great additional incentive to utilize sustainable CO2 like the supply that we're capturing. Is there anything else that you want to leave viewers with before we go today? You know, Remora is super excited to be part of GATA. We are bringing online this massive new supply of sustainable, reliable CO2, and we're looking for partners. We're looking for partners um, that are interested in utilizing the CO2, potentially interested in distributing the CO2, and you know we're, we're interested in partners who want to help us, whether that's with purification or with other you know, forms of CO2 expertise. So anyone that's interested in getting involved with this new solution, this new technology, as our company dramatically scales up over the next couple of years, feel free to reach out. Um, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn or via email. You can reach out to anyone else on the team. And the best place to start is just emailing hello at remoracarbon.com. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today and welcome to the association. We look forward to working with you. To learn more about Remora, click the link in the description below. The company will also have representatives at this year's SMC, so be sure to find them and welcome them to Ghana. Being active for more than 70 years, always following the original mission. Wherever gas is the integral part and provides energy for everyday life, there will be the technological and productive commitment from Cavani Group. Next on the show, we welcome Carrie Roberts, Business Development Manager for Worthington Industries. Carrie, thank you for being with us today. Carrie, you recently gave a presentation at the Purity Plus meeting entitled Cannabis Business Crash Course 101. For viewers who weren't in attendance, can you give us a brief overview of some of the key points you touched on during that presentation? So the intent of the presentation was to give people in the gas and welding um, industry a more in-depth overview of a very complex industry that they might currently be serving or considering serving. Um, the cannabis industry is one of the most complex and highly regulated industries in the country right now. And I wanted to give some background on the history of cannabis, talk about some of the challenges that the industry faces, um, as well as what some of the upside and the opportunities in the industry were. So um, a lot of people look at the cannabis industry and they, they see it kind of as this new green rush. And um, while it certainly has the potential to be lucrative, um, I think it's really critical business strategy to understand both the potential upside of an industry, 
uh, as well as the potential downside and the challenges that an industry faces and, and how that might impact your business. So um, I started the presentation kind of going through a history of the cannabis plant and how cannabis went from being a legal product um, in the U.S. pharmacopoeia back in, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, to then becoming federally illegal under the Nixon administration in the 1970s. Um, then, you know, over the course of 25, 26 years, it became legal for medical use in California in 1996. Um, and then it became legal for adult use. So for adults 21 and over, it became legal for the first time um, in Colorado in 2012. And all of this was happening despite the fact that cannabis is still considered a Schedule One controlled substance um, under the Controlled Substances Act. And it's still in the same category um, as LSD and heroin. So um, I discussed some of the the major issues that impact the cannabis industry. One of the biggest issues is kind of this ever-changing landscape between federal regulation and state regulation and kind of the ongoing challenges that those differences create for both cannabis industry operators as well as the businesses that, that serve that industry. So for ancillary companies such as gas and welding distributors. Um, I talked about the challenges of banking and financial services in the cannabis industry and how with cannabis still being a schedule one controlled substance that mainstream FDIC insured banks have been generally unwilling to provide banking services um, to cannabis businesses out of the fear that deposits that they take from cannabis businesses could violate um, federal anti-money laundering laws. So it, it's a scary proposition for a lot of banks. And in that same vein, kind of that lack of banking services makes it really challenging for, for many cannabis businesses to operate. A lot of them operate as cash only businesses. So it makes it difficult from both uh, an operating standpoint as a business operator to only be able to operate in cash. It's a safety risk to employees, to consumers, but it also means that vendors or suppliers to those cannabis businesses also have to have processes in place to be able to accept and transport um, potentially large amounts of cash. And um, because of the banking situation, it also makes it really difficult for cannabis businesses to secure loans, to get lines of credit. Um, and I think it's important to know that. So if you're an organization that's serving the industry, you want to make sure that you've got business processes in place to not only be able to accept cash payments, but if you do decide to extend terms to a, to a customer or client, to make sure that you, you know, for example, keep an eye on receivables and make sure that those don't get stretched out too far. Um, because I've seen in many instances where cannabis businesses who were doing well in a certain market, then suddenly that market shifts and then those licensees aren't doing so well and then they end up defaulting on payments and then it's it's the vendors who are kind of left holding the bag another thing that i educated that the audience on was the impacts of section 280e of the irs tax code which essentially says that if you traffic in a schedule one or a schedule two controlled substance and again cannabis is still considered a schedule one controlled substance um, that you can't take any business deductions other than cost of goods sold. So while a lot of people, like it, it appears from the outside that a lot of these businesses are making a lot of money, um, as a cannabis operator, because of the tax implications, sometimes these businesses are operating in 70 to 80% tax bracket. And that some of them might be operating at a loss or, or within very tight margins. Um, I also discussed some of the basics around cultivation and the cannabis growing cycle and how CO2, um, for example, is a critical component of plant photosynthesis and that many operators who have indoor controlled environment facilities introduce CO2 into those grow rooms where it can increase plant yields up to 40%. Um, and I also presented on the most popular methods of cannabis extraction 
And one of those methods includes CO2 extraction. So CO2 extraction uses a high pressure form of CO2. So CO2 that's used in a supercritical state, which is then able to remove the, the compounds from the plant. Um, using CO2 uh, as a solvent, the output is less efficient than it would be in hydrocarbon extraction. So it requires a bit more post-processing to remove some of the undesirable components like um, chlorophyll, fats, waxes, lipids, but it's a very popular extraction method as it's viewed um, as a less dangerous extraction method than hydrocarbon extraction. Um, I talked about hydrocarbon extraction and hydrocarbon extraction uses butane, propane, and isobutane, um, or kind of a blend of those hydrocarbons. Um, they're used at very cold temperature, which is ideal because then those solvents um, allow for the preservation of some very volatile compounds that are in the cannabis plant. And hydrocarbons can then selectively and efficiently remove the most desired compounds from the cannabis uh, biomass while leaving a lot of the undesirables behind. Um, talked about how in the hydrocarbon extraction world that cylinder cleanliness and gas purity are key areas to focus on for the extraction industry now and moving forward. Um, so it should be something that's considered out of the gate for gas and, gas and welding distributors um, who are wanting to operate in this space. Um, and it's important that, that the, the pressure cylinders that are used to hold the hydrocarbons for this industry are free of weld slag, rust, particulates, oils, um, other residue um, in those cylinders that if it's introduced into the extraction and processing process, it can severely impact the end product um, and a processor's business operations. So this, this is where Worthington um, was very innovative and forward thinking and developed the first and only um, purpose-built dot, uh, the LP239 100 pound stainless steel cylinder solution for the biomass extraction industry, which really helps mitigate the chances of contaminants being found in the cylinder or impacting the end product. And while cylinder cleanliness is paramount in the botanical extraction industry, gas purity is probably even more important uh, component of the process. So most states require a minimum of 99.5% purity for hydrocarbons. And those hydrocarbons should be free of BTEX, alcohols, heavy metals, and other impurities. So if, if you're already operating in this space or if you're considering operating in this space, um, just understand that the gas package as a whole is critical to the quality of the end product. So would really encourage people um, to work with vendors and suppliers who understand the nuances of the industry and the importance of both the cylinder and the gas quality in order to best support um, their end user customers. Um, talks about uh, the third main extraction method, which is ethanol extraction. So that actually uses food grade ethanol as a solvent, which the cannabis biomass is soaked in um, to extract the, the components. And that's usually used for larger scale extraction and manufacturing. Um, Number one, it's hard to store large amounts of hydrocarbon on site. So um, in large scale extraction, ethanol is, is frequently used, but there's also challenges there in that it's a very strong solvent that pulls really everything out of the cannabis plant. So it requires a lot of post-processing um, to get to a more refined product. And then the last method of extraction that I discussed was solventless extraction. So solventless is extraction um, is a way to mechanically separate the plant biomass and it uses pressure, temperature, filtration to kind of concentrate the essential compounds from the plant material. Um, and this, this is an example of where dry ice is used. And while solventless extraction is a much more labor intensive process and difficult to do at scale, it, it's one of the methods that's most preferred by cannabis enthusiasts. For states like New York that maybe had medical marijuana previously, but have recently transitioned to legal adult use, how do the regulations change and how will that impact GOTA members in those states? Every state's regulations are going to vary 
uh, when it goes from having a medical only market to having both a medical and an adult use market. And since you specifically asked about New York, I think that's actually a really great example of how different a medical and adult use market can be. So um, under the, the medical program in New York, operators were required to be fully vertically integrated. So that meant that the operators who held those licenses, they had to cultivate it, they had to process it, and they had to retail it. Um, and under the medical program in New York, um, there are only 10 medical licenses available. So I feel like in that scenario, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for people in the gas and welding business to, to be involved in the marketplace. Um, under the, the new adult use program, operators are actually not allowed to be vertically integrated. So if you're a retailer, you cannot also cultivate and process. Um, there, there is a way that if you're a cultivator, you can process, or if you're a processor, you can cultivate, but you can't be a cultivator, processor, and retail. So it's a different market in kind of how it's structured. And whereas there were only 10 vertically integrated medical marijuana licenses in New York, once the, the New York adult use market is fully licensed and operational, there will be hundreds of licensed dispensaries, cultivation and processing operations, which I feel like will open up an incredible number of opportunities for, for GATA members in, in, the, in the state. Carrie, are there any last thoughts that you wanted to leave us with, either about the state of the industry right now or where you see it heading down the road? Um, the, the current state of, of the, the, the legal cannabis industry, it's a high growth, um, it's a very high growth market. We've got 38 states that have medical marijuana programs. We've now got 21 states that have adult use programs. Um, and kind of as last words, I'd say that the legal cannabis industry is an absolutely fascinating market. Um, it's full of lots of ups and downs and highs and lows. Um, and sometimes it's been said that the only constant in the cannabis industry is its inconsistency. And people often relate cannabis years to dog years that, you know, the amount of change and the rate of change that occurs in the cannabis industry in a single year um, could be equivalent to the amount of change that a mature industry might experience in seven years. So, I think I'd say that the cannabis industry maybe isn't for the faint of heart. It might not be an industry for everyone, but if it's an industry that you're either currently operating in or considering operating in, um, my final thoughts and advice would be to educate yourself, be smart, have fun, um, and just hold on for what has the potential to be a very lucrative and exciting ride. Carrie, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. To reach out to Carrie, click the link in the description below. Gas distributors, tank repair shops, cryogenic techs. Live the Equigas experience and find out for yourself. Send us a picture and we'll help you identify what you really need. We have the equipment you need with the service you deserve. Make your life easier. Give us a call today. We answer the phone and ship the same day. Today's SMC update is brought to you by Black Stallion. The new Black Stallion flame resistant plaid work shirt is snappy. The convenient metal snaps are quick and easy and provide a secure fit. Snap into action and contact us today for more information. Registration is now open for GATA's 2023-2024 scholarship program. However, you need to act fast because the application deadline for the program is March 17th. All applications must be postmarked by that date. Scholarships are available to children and employees of current GATA member companies. There are 15 scholarships of $2,000 each available for fall 2023. This program is funded through member contributions, and GATA will match all member contributions up to a total not to exceed $25,000. For more information about applying for the scholarship or to donate, click the link in the description below. We're now less than two months away from GATA's SMC in Philadelphia, which takes place May 6th to the 8th. The theme for this year is 365 Intentional Leadership. If you missed the February 15th episode, we spoke with GATA President Robert Anders about the show. To see that interview, click the link in the description below. 
If you've already registered for the show, make sure to make use of the SMC website before you attend. The Meet Your Board article for the second quarter issue of Welding Gases Today is all about how to get the most out of your experience at the show, and many of the answers came down to pre-preparation. This goes hand in hand with this year's theme of intentionality. Once you register for the show, you can log in through the SMC website to see great information, including a full attendee list. This list can be sorted by name or by company, and it's a great resource for planning out your time and meetings ahead of the show. You can also go to the contact booth page to see the floor layout. As we get closer to the show, you'll be able to see the exhibitors and booth numbers to put together a plan of attack on what you want to see during the contact booth program on May 7th. This year also marks the return for the third consecutive year of the Educational Tracks program. On Sunday, May 7th, you'll have the opportunity to attend two out of six presentations. These presentations feature topics ranging from relationship selling to technology and everything in between. From 9 o'clock to 9.50, you'll have the opportunity to attend one of three sessions. Relationship Selling with Randy Squibb, The Journey of a 90% Gas Independent with Abity Butler Moore, or a Consultants Roundtable with our amazing Gala Consultants. Following a brief break from 10.15 to 11.05, you'll have the opportunity to attend a second session from three options. Maximizing your bottom line with your existing customers with Todd Sondag, using technology to improve safety culture with Bill Woods, or a succession planning panel featuring Bill Baxter, Jack Butler, and Wally Brandt, moderated by Marie Raderman. These sessions are in addition to the wonderful main stage and keynote presenters that we have in place throughout the conference. Finally, make sure to register in advance if you want to participate in the Young Professionals Lunch and Learn and Scavenger Hunt, which takes place on Saturday, May 6th, or the Women of Gas and Welding Meet and Greet, which also takes place on Saturday, May 6th, right before the newcomer's reception. The Gauda National Conventions are known as the must-attend events of the year for good reason, and this year's SMC looks to set yet another attendance record. If you haven't registered yet, make sure you do so today. And keep an eye on the SMC website and the Gauda Connection for up-to-the-minute updates on this year's SMC. And make sure you tune in for our April 15th episode of Gauda TV for our last pre-SMC update. We can't wait to see everyone together again in Philadelphia this year. Hobart Institute of Welding Technology offers an AWS certified welding supervisor prep for exam course. This course teaches distributors how to bring real value to their customers by assisting them to reduce weld metal volume, reduce rejects, rework, scrap, and much more. Check our website to see all courses or contact us today at 937-332-9500 for more information on enrollment requirements. Today's member news segment is brought to you by Anthony Welded Products. With carts, cradles, cages, and pallets, Anthony has a model for every purpose. We begin today by extending our condolences to the friends and family of Robert Boudet, who passed away at the age of 86. Robert was an active GAUDA member who owned and operated Flint Welding Supply and Saginaw Welding Supply, which was founded by his parents, Stefan and Alice. He will be missed by all who knew him. In happier news, Meredith Gas Partners announced that it had acquired certain assets of Magna Gas Corporation in Texas, Louisiana, and Indiana. The acquisition includes various equipment inventory and intellectual property, which will allow Meredith to expand its operations and services in these regions. Dynabraid announced that it acquired Global Abrasive Products. Coastal Welding Supply will host its annual Emerging Technology and Metal Fabrication event on April 21st at Del Mar College. The event is designed exclusively for instructors and educators involved in teaching welding and other industrial crafts to the future workforce. SureWorks welcomed Samuel Grovum to its sales team as Territory Account Manager for the Pacific Northwest. Dennis Kayak was named the 2023 AWS President. Congratulations, Dennis! WeldCoa named Todd Campbell as its new sales director. ARC3 opened a new branch in Charlottesville, Virginia. CK Supply added four new members to its team. Hannah Friedrich joins the team's new marketing coordinator, Andrew Ray will serve as CK Safety Coordinator, and Nikki Bryant and Katie Lancey will serve as Accounts Receivable Specialists. FIBA Technologies appointed Madeline Calder as its new Inside Sales Manager. And finally, ES Tech Group was named a great place to work in the U.S. for the fifth year in a row by Great Place to Work, a global authority on workplace culture. Congratulations to ES Tech for this honor. To learn more about any of these member news items, or to submit member news of your own, read the full March 15th Gauda Connection in your email inbox today, or by clicking the link in the description below.
before we go today, I just wanted to remind you once again that we're less than two months away from this year's SMC in Philadelphia, and both the hotels and the contact booth program are filling up fast. If you would like to participate in the contact booth program, make sure to contact Andrea Levy today using the email in the description below. If the program is already full, make sure to put your name on that waiting list. And also a reminder that this year's first quarter issue of Welding and Gases Today and the 2023 Buyer's Guide are both online now and should be hitting your desk soon. The Buyer's Guide is our once a year single source reference of essential information about the leading manufacturers, suppliers, and service providers in the Welding and Gases Supply Channel. The aim of the Buyer's Guide is to help facilitate GAUTA members doing business with other members, and it's an excellent resource to enhance your business and improve and facilitate your relationships throughout the year. And it goes hand in hand with our online buyer's guide. So make sure to check out both of these publications using the link in the description below. And that's our show for this month. Thank you to all who tuned in. For all of us here at Gauda TV, this is Steve Guillermo signing off.